Turn your Bible this morning to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. And I'll begin by reading the first two verses, Romans chapter 12, we'll read verses 1 and 2. And we're going to look at and talk about for the next few weeks about, he makes mention of presenting your body as a living sacrifice. We're going to talk about living for the Lord. What does that exactly mean? What does that entail, so to speak? What's he saying that we as Christians should be doing when he says to present ourselves as a living sacrifice? He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, notice that he begins by, as he says, beseech you. He's really pleading with them, making, you know, a, a really, you know, just emotional appeal urging them encouraging them this is what you need to do uh you know he really believes this and you know sincerity in what you're saying to people and uh, belief in that goes a long way into getting them to listen to what you're saying doesn't he and he's saying i beseech you by the mercies of god now people need motivation don't they anything you do something motivates you to do it doesn't it? of course i have heard some people who've done some stupid things Why'd you do it? I don't know. You ever heard that from people? You might have even said this before. You might have done something stupid. And they said, well, what in the world? Why in the world did you do that? Well, I don't know. But something motivated them to do it. Anything you do, there's something that motivates you to do it. And what he's saying here, let this be your motivation. Because what I'm asking you to do is to sacrifice. In other words, to give up. To live for God and to live for others. Now, you've got to have some kind of motivation to do this because you're selfish by nature. Everybody's selfish by nature. We're self-centered by nature. We want what we want. We could care less if anybody else gets what they want. That's, just, that's, our, that's, our, that's who we are. And you've got to, as I said, train yourself to get over that mentality and to understand and to realize the world doesn't revolve around you. You're not the most important thing going on in the world right now. And you, know, you might think you are sometimes, but you're really not. You know, uh, you're just, you're, and, and you need motivation. <clears throat> Something's got to motivate you to be willing to give up yourself and to sacrifice your time and your resources and to use your talents and your abilities to benefit other people, not just to promote and to lift up and enhance yourself and your own well-being. So you've got to be, something's got to motivate you and get you over that. And he says, by the mercy, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Think about all that God has done for you. Think about all the promises God has made unto you. And that within itself should motivate you to want to do what? Serve the Lord by serving others. Be willing to sacrifice of oneself, to give up for others' benefit. That's what sacrifice and service is all about, isn't it? And he's saying, this should motivate you. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it should motivate us. What motivated Jesus to go to the cross? Was it for his own personal gain? His own self-promotion? No, it wasn't. What other position could he have been elevated to that was greater than the one that he had? He was the Son of God. He was the creator of all the universe. What was his motivation for doing what he done? Love for you. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for you. He sacrificed himself, not for himself, but for you. That was his motivation. And that's what Paul is saying right here. You know, think of all that God has done for you. Let that motivate you to want to do what? to sacrifice and to give up and to serve Him. And we serve Him mainly by what? Serving other people. Sacrificing and doing things for other people. So, there's your motivation. He's pleading with Him, look, do it because of what, how good God's been to you. You can't think of any other reason other than that. He says, now here's what He's asking them to do. He says, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. When we think in terms of sacrifice, we think of somebody dying, don't we? Well, what he's saying is this is, look, you know, God wants you to live for him each and every day. A living sacrifice. And we're going to talk about that 
in the weeks to come as we look through these next few chapters in the book of Romans. Living for the Lord. What is living for the Lord? What does that mean? It's a whole lot more than just coming to church two, three times a week, however many times you come, and that's it. That's not living for the Lord. And we're going to talk about that. That's preparing you to live for the Lord. You should never view what you're doing this morning as a sacrifice, as service. You sacrifice and serve during the week. This is worship, my friend. This is God preparing you to go out and live for Him each and every day. But we think we've done God a favor by coming to church here this morning. Many people have that mentality. God, I've done you a favor. You ought to be proud of me. I've sacrificed my Sunday morning and I've come to church. My friend, it's a privilege to be able to come to church. And we ought to see it that way. It shouldn't be no sacrifice. It shouldn't be no big thing that you really had to give something up for to do this year or this morning. It's something you ought to want to do. It's something you ought to be thankful about doing. So we're going to talk about living for the Lord. He said, live. He says, live for the Lord. He says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? He says, reasonable service. You don't think it would be reasonable for someone who has done so much for you and is going to, and still doing that for you and is going to do it for you to live for him? You remember the episode of Andy Griffin where Andy saved Gomer's life? Remember that one? Oh, mercy sakes. Gomer spent the next, what, few days, weeks, months trying to make it up to her. Andy becomes so annoyed by him doing that. He says, I've got, I'm going to let him save my life so he'll feel like he's paid me back so he'll quit, you know, doing all these, cutting his firewood and doing all these things for me. <laughs> so they set up. Or supposedly a gas leak. Andy's laying there, you know, and they made it where, you know, Gomer's going to come in and save his life. Well, Gomer comes in and begins to panic, and he gets overcome with the gas leak. <laughs> and he passes out. Well, Andy ends up, what, having to save him again? He's like, oh, my goodness. So he had to fix it where Gomer got the impression that he really saved Andy's life as a payback for it. But the point I'm making is this, you know, you know, Gomer's saying, man, look, all you've done for me, the least I can do is do all your chores and chop your wood and do all this, because you saved my life. Jesus Christ died for your sins on Calvary's cross. He's given you eternal life that cannot be taken from you nor forfeited. He's coming back again for you one day. He's prepared a place for you in heaven, my friend. Now, do you not think it's reasonable that we should do what? Live for him? because of what he's done for us. That's what he's saying to them. It's reasonable when you think about it for someone who's done so much for you and made so many promises to you that you could live for him. He says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Conformed. Transformed. We conform by, to the world by listening and allowing the world to influence our decisions and our morality and our rights and our wrongs. We transform by doing what? Reading and studying and obeying and basing our decisions in our life upon what? The Word of God. Because the world's standards and morality, they changed constantly. God's word never changes. So if you want to be transformed, it's got to be by the word of God because the world will conform you. And he says, don't be conformed, be transformed. That's why the word of God is so important to the believer to study, to read. To allow it to be the reason you make decisions that you make based upon what you know to be the truth from the Word of God. It is that essential. It is that important. Because if you don't, you're going to conform. You're going to make decisions based upon the logic and the philosophy and man's intelligence as far as he refers to himself as being intelligent making decisions and his knowledge. Make them based upon the Word of God. 
and what the Word of God teaches. So he's saying, look, I want you to live for the Lord. And this should motivate you to live for the Lord for what all he's done for you. Don't be conformed to this world. You're going to be separate from this world. You're going to be different from this world. Be transformed. Now, the first thing I want to talk about when we begin this morning is in relation to the church and how we are to live for the Lord in relation to the abilities and the talents and the opportunities that God gives us to live for Him. He says in verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, Paul wrote in another one of his letters, I am what I am by the grace of God. Each one of us sitting here this morning, each one that's hearing my voice this morning, you are what you are by the grace of God. To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Humility. Boy, that's a quality that's lacking today in our world that we live in, isn't it? If you don't believe me, go out and just observe people how full of themselves they are. And they are, aren't they? But he's saying here, look, be humble. Be humble. Realize and appreciate and understand whatever position you have been able to achieve in life or what you've been able to do in life. Remember how you got there. Remember that it was God that allowed you and gave you the opportunity and gave you the strength and gave you the power and gave you the grace to be what you are. Anything that you've accomplished, all glory, all credit must go to who? God Almighty. But that's against our nature. If we do something, man, we won't pat it on the back for it. We won't be told how good we are, no, how great we are. And he's saying right here, look, in serving the Lord and in serving others and using the gifts and abilities that God has given you, you need to be humble about it. You need to be humble and realize where they came from. And here's the thing about it. To whom much has been given, much will be required. If God has blessed you with a talent and with a gift and with an ability and with the opportunity to serve Him, my friend, you can rest assured of this. You're accountable to Him one day for what you've done with it and how you've done it and what you accomplished through it. So you better stay humble. You better realize and understand Apart from God, we can do nothing. Matter of fact, Christ said in John chapter 15, He was the vine with the branches. If we're separated from Him, apart from Him, we can do nothing. God is our source of strength, our source of power. We can't do anything apart from Him. We need to realize that and to be humble and to appreciate the fact that God is the one who deserves the credit. Who should get the credit? We should praise and thank Him. So He's saying, "Look, don't get." You've heard this expression, "Don't get the big head." You've heard people say, "You're getting too big for your britches." You've heard that one. Some of these old cliches, you younger kids don't hear much anymore, do you? Some of the things that we had to hear when we were growing up. But there was truth in those. There's truth in them. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar is an example of Scripture of someone that God raised up. It wasn't that Nebuchadnezzar was this great, you know, uh, general, so to speak, or this great uh, leader of men and such like that. And, and he just, and at one time he was the, you know, most powerful person in the world. And there's been others that have come, that were before him and have come since then, that God has allowed to elevate to that position. But he, you talk about somebody that was full of himself. Now he was, man, you know. He didn't realize and understand the only reason he was in the position that he was in was because God allowed him to be raised up to do what? To take the nation of Israel captive, to chastise them, to bring them back to him so they would repent of the wickedness, the evil that they had done, and turn back into the Lord. But anyway, 
man, he built a statue, demanded everybody when they heard the music, bow down and worship that statue. Well, we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do so. He got so angry, so upset. He said, fire that furnace up harder than it's ever been. Throw them in there. They come out unscathed, didn't they? That should have gone in himself. I said, hey, now, wait a minute. I'm, you know. And he said, he said, you know, their God is God. But he was still a proud individual. I mean proud. He went out one day, walked around, seen how my, and my Babylon was magnificent. It was. Look what I've done, he said. Look what my hands have accomplished. What happened to him? The Bible says he lived like an animal for seven years. Went out and grazed in the fields like a like cattle. Lost his mind. This people has gone crazy. But finally one day he looked up to heaven and he realized, he understood. And he gave glory to God, didn't he? And God restored him to his right mind. You see, he got humbled, didn't he? He got humble. He realized and appreciated the fact that everything that he had done, everything he had accomplished, all he was was because of the grace of God. We need to realize the same thing. Every one of us, we are what we are by the grace of God. All glory, all praise goes to him. So stay humble. Stay humble. Because if you don't, here's what's going to happen. You will be humble. Pride goes before destruction and a Holy Spirit before a fall. You want to fall? Get so proud that you feel like you don't need nobody. You're self-sufficient. You're the stuff, so to speak. I guarantee you, my friend, God can topple anybody. He can topple you too. You better stay humble. Verse 4, for, we, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Now, we know this. Paul wrote this in his letter to the Corinthians. Comparing the body of Christ, the church, to the human body. And how the human body is composed of many different, uh, you know, uh, uh, parts. Uh, you have hands, you have feet. We can go on and on, list them, eyes, ears, and make comparison to that. They all have different functions. And they're all needful of one another. It operates and it works together, doesn't it? Well, he says the, church, the body of Christ is the same way. Every one of us is different. Every one of us is unique, but we're needed as part of the body. Now, some you, some you know, gain more prominence. Uh, some are paid more attention to. I mean, they are. But all parts are necessary, aren't they? They really are. And that's what he's saying right here. And God has blessed each body with everything that is needful for that body to function properly and to be a witness and a testimony to His honor his glory. Now it's up to us it's up to us to accept our role and to perform to the honor and the glory of God by serving him by through serving others. And that's what we're going to talk about here and that's what he's saying right here. Many different individuals but we do what? To live for the Lord we do what? We use our ability, our talents, our resources, our time. And that's something I think many people are more, most stingy with, is their time. And you can understand that when you think about it. <coughs> because my, course, some people study, they're stingy with money too. <laughs> but the thing about money, I can go spend all my money today. My wife would kill me if I did. But I'm gonna get money back. I can get money back. I can get it back. I can go work and get it back. Might not get all of it back, but I can get money back. If I, if, I, if, I, if I lose money, I can get it back. But you see, when I lose time, I don't get time back. That, that, there's, there's no bank to print no more time. That's it. And I think people are really stingy and selfish with their time. They want it to themselves. I need my time. This is my time. I want to do what I want to do. You see what I'm saying? And I think that's the one thing that people are distinguished with. They don't want to sacrifice any of their time to help other people and to do things for other people because you say, that's my time. My time to do what I want to do. Who gives you that time? Where's that time come from? Whose time is it really? Just like money. 
whose money is it you have in your wallet this morning? Oh, you may not have no money. A lot of people don't carry cash. <laughs> uh, I'm one of them. I'm gonna have to figure out something to do because I go now into uh, when I pay for my fuel when I go there. Son, you're gonna have exact change now. Most of these people, they don't. They shortage of coins is what they tell me. You know. Uh, anyway, but you know, you may not. You may just have. You may have. You know, a credit card or whatever. Uh, uh, you know. And, but you say, well, I have access to. But listen, you don't have any money. You've been entrusted with God's money. You don't have it. It's not yours. It's God's. If you think it's yours, how much of it you take with you when you die? Somebody else will have it then. You see what I'm saying? It just passes down to the next person. You just get to use it for a while. Because you didn't bring anything in this world, you're not going to take anything with you. So how's it going to be? How can it be yours? It's not. You just use it for a little while. Time, anything else you want to look at and think about, it's not yours. It belongs to God. Now, we don't always consult God with what we do with it, don't do we? No, we don't. Sometimes we see something we want selfishly, we go get it no matter what because I want it. It's my money. You see these commercials? It's my money and I want it now. I can't think. I just you know I can't even think who does that commercial. But I just remember that phrase in it. It's my money and I want it now. And that's how people see stuff. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. If we see things that it's God's, it's God's, it's God's, and we'd be better off, wouldn't we? It's not mine. It's God's. So I need to ask whose it is. What I need to do with it. Wouldn't that seem logical to you? If it's not yours and it belongs to God, which it does, whether you want to admit it or not, you may want to admit it. No, it's not here. It's mine. I work for it. Who give you the work? Who give you the health to work? Who give you the strength to work? If it's not yours then, and it belongs to God, then do you not think he might ought to have a little bit of say-so in what we do with it? I would think he would, wouldn't you? With your money and your time. But does he ever get consulted about that? Very rarely does he. No, it's mine. It's mine. Everything you've been given is to be used what? For God's honor and glory. To serve him by serving others. But it's hard for us to develop that mentality. You have a sinful, selfish, self-centered nature that's really hard to overcome. I mean, it's really hard to overcome. Because you have Satan there whispering your ear all the time telling you, look, be selfish. Be self-centered. Look out for yourself. Nobody else is going to. God's not telling you the truth. And that's, you know, and it just, it really takes some work and some effort to say, all right, God, it's yours. What do you want me to do with it? What would you have me to do? Just that simple. But we don't see it that way sometimes. But he's saying, look, everything you have, everything you are, everything you've been blessed with, belongs to God. Use it for his honor and glory. So we know we're all different. Nobody's got the same amount. Well, they might be very few... Nobody's got the same amount of money. Everybody's got different amounts of money. Everybody's got, we, we refer to whether that people have more time than I have. No, you don't. Everybody's got 24 hours a day. It's just what you choose to do at that time. But that's one excuse you can't use. So-and-so's got more time than I have. No, they don't. They, you, because you get 24 hours and they get 24 hours. just how you decide you want to do, use your time. That's, you know, that's up to you. So, you know, we all got the same amount of time. We've got different money. We've got different abilities. But it's all to be done what? used in consultation with God through prayer. What do you got to do with it, God? How do you want me to use it? What's beneficial? What's best? So in verse 5 it says, So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members have one of another. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever, whatever the gift you have, you're to use it wisely in a matter to be what? Help other people and to serve God. That's what he's talking about when he says living Sacrifice. Living for the Lord. That's exactly what he's saying. Now we've got to ask ourselves, are we doing that? Are we living for the Lord? Are we living for ourselves? You know, if you want to see how selfish man is, you let, that, you let some adversity come his way and you'll see how selfish man is. If you've not learned anything at all from this pandemic, 
If you'll just open your eyes and you'll look around and you'll see how selfish people are. How self-centered people are. I mean, really, honestly, think about what I'm saying. Adversity has come our way. Look how selfishly people have acted. What's motivated them to do some of the things that they have done? And I'm just going to use this as an example. I, and I mean, look, I'm not making a lot of the people that have done this. I mean, that's their, if they wanted to do this, they had the right to do this. All right, we have a pandemic hit. You go to the store, can't find a roll of toilet paper anywhere. Now, does this <coughs> virus make people go to the bathroom more than it did before it hit? No, it doesn't, does it? Well, then why did people go and buy truckloads of toilet paper? Selfishness. Selfishness. Self-centered, looking out for sale. I don't care if anybody else ain't got it. I'm going to have enough to last me for however long. See, well, that's just one example. Now, you can describe that any way you want to describe it. How can you describe it other than this being what? Self-centered. I'm thinking about myself. I don't care if anybody else got any of it or not. I'm getting for myself. That's just one example. And I know there's different thoughts and different feelings about the social distances and going here and going there and doing all these things and such and such like that. But you see in all it how selfish people are, how self-centered people are. Don't really care about anyone or anything but themselves. And that's what motivates them to make some of the decisions they make. They don't look at anything other than their life, what's going on in their life, and they make decisions based upon that and upon nothing else. So if, if you've not seen anything from this pandemic, what you have seen is just how selfish and self-centered man really is. And he is, isn't he? He most certainly is. You see, we've got to get past as Christians. I don't expect the world to behave any different than what they're behaving. Why do you expect people that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior to act any different than what they're acting like right now? That's how they're going to act. But we as Christians, we know better. Or we should know better. But what society is, you see many Christians acting just like the world acts. Behaving just like the world behaves. Thinking just like the world thinks. Same, same thing, same thing. We've got to, as Christians, as believers, put... God first. He said, well, I can do that. I can do that. Can you? Have you? Are you? Now, the second one, put other people before you do yourself. Oh, now, wait a minute. Whoa. <laughs> no, I can't do that. What did Jesus say the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and what? Thy neighbor as thyself. Oh, my goodness. You mean living for the Lord means putting God first, then putting others second. And you mean I, I, I fit on the bottom of that ring? You know, you want me to be the last? Think about it. Is Jesus not our example? Is he or isn't he? He is, isn't he? Well, you tell me when he lived his life upon the earth, what came first to him? Doing the Father's will, wasn't it? Wasn't it? What was second? What was second on his list? You were. I am. Everybody else was. Because if he'd been self-centered and selfish, he'd never went to the cross. He'd never died on the cross. But he did that because of you and because of me, because he put our needs before his. Our wish, our God first, others second, then himself. Now, if he's our example, should we not be patterning our lives after that? But my goodness, you try to get people to do that, see what a fight you get on your hands. But you see. That's one thing that this should have opened our eyes to see and get people to realize. I know it has mine. Just how selfish and self-centered man really is.
That's why we need Jesus. Amen. That's why Jesus had to come to die on the cross for our self-centeredness, our selfishness, our sinfulness. Aren't you thankful that he did? Aren't you thankful that he did? I'm so thankful that he loved us enough to do just that, aren't you? And he did. He did that for everybody. Everybody. All he asks you to do is to believe. Acknowledge your sinfulness. Acknowledge your selfishness. Oh, that's so hard to get people to do. If you want to make somebody mad, call them selfish. I'm not selfish. What do you mean I'm selfish? It tires people all the pieces, don't you? I'm not self-centered. What do you mean calling me self-centered? The Bible calls you that, too. Tough to take, isn't it? Hard to take, isn't it? Preacher, don't be talking to us that way. We're Christians. We're believers. You know, be getting on these people out here doing all these bad things. We're not, you know, you know don't, don't be talking to, to call me selfish. Don't be calling me. I'm calling you and I'm calling myself selfish and self-centered. Because that's what we are. That's who we are. That's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Live for the Lord. Quit living for yourself. Living for others. Live for the Lord. Or trying to satisfy. I'm not saying you shouldn't be living. I'm saying quit trying to please other people and what they want you to do. You're never going to accomplish anything being a people pleaser because you can't please everybody. I can please this group, but I'll make this group mad at me. I can please this group, but I'll make this group mad at me. You can't please people. Man, that's impossible. The eyes of man will never satisfy. You've got to live for the Lord. Use your abilities, your gifts, your talents to do what? To serve him by serving other people. That's what it means presenting your body as a living sacrifice. To be able to give up all claims, all rights, and place them in God's hands. You know, during this time, everybody, everybody, screaming about the rights Protesters, non-protesters, Democrats, Republicans, everybody screaming about my rights. What about my rights to do this? What about my rights to do this? What about my rights to do that? Once again, shows you how selfish we are, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? What this country needs is a good old-fashioned revival. I'm not talking about just feeling good for a few days. I'm talking about a total, complete giving up oneself and putting ourselves in the Lord's hands and saying, God, use me for your honor and glory. Paul referred to himself many times in Scripture as a prisoner. Who was he a prisoner of? He's a prisoner of Jesus. Of course, we don't, you know, our day and time now we live in, even prisoners scream out for rights. Everybody, everybody's screaming out for their rights. But if you're someone's prisoner, they have control over you, don't they? They're in charge of you. They tell you what to do, don't they? If you're a servant, they tell you what to do, don't they? He said, I'm a prisoner. I'm a servant of the Lord. Can we say the same thing? Are we servants? Are we a prisoner of the Lord? Do we let God control our lives? And that's what I want to, the point I want you to get this morning is this. Who's, who's calling the shots? Who's calling the shots in your life? You or the Lord? Because if you're going to present yourself as a living sacrifice unto God, then guess who gets to call the shots? Guess who the boss is? Or should be the boss? That's God, isn't it? That's God. <coughs> present your bodies a living sacrifice which is your reasonable service unto the Lord. If you're here today, if you're listening to this today, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to understand just how much He loved you, how He came and died on the cross for your sins, gave of Himself, that you can have it, that, that you can have eternal life. Anybody can have eternal life that wants it. Through faith in Jesus. Because he paid sin's death. The 
the gift is for you to receive through faith. And Christians today, are we really, I mean really, motivated by what God has done for us and really, really living for the Lord? We need to ask ourselves that question. Who do we live? Well, what, well, who do we live for at times? What's our lives all about? Look at all God's blessed you with. How are you using it? What are you doing with it? Because one day, as he also speaks in the book of Romans, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll give an account for what we've done with our life. Think about that. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this morning praising and thanking you once again, God, for your goodness and your mercy and your grace, God, during these times. Thank you, God, for our church. Thank you, God, for the, the privilege and opportunity to stand this morning and to preach. God, if anyone doesn't know Jesus Christ that's here this morning, I pray today will be the day they turn to him in faith. If someone's listening to this, God, that doesn't know your son, they give their heart and life to Jesus and be saved. Help us, God, to live for you, to quit being so self-centered and so selfish, and to live for you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand now and we sing a song of invitation. Page 177. <laughs> meeting this morning and the business meeting not after evening service. Anyone? Are our hearts and minds clear? All right then. Uh, David Brooks dismiss us, then you'll be at liberty to go. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Gracious and loving.